Tonight's panel has been put together very, very quickly in order to respond to what we see as a crisis uh, of language as well as a crisis of politics uh, that surrounds us at the moment in the wake of the Paris attacks, but not only in reference to the Paris attacks, because as we know, the Paris attacks, shocking and cataclysmic as they uh, have been, and um, so uh, uh, important in a way in terms of the way in which our politics is lived out and our experience of ourselves in Europe is understood and lived out. Of course, those attacks come in the wake of and in relation to many other attacks uh, on our cities and on our lives that have been taking place um, all over Europe and, of course, in the rest of the world as well. So the panel was put forward um, with the great generosity of the six speakers who very much at the last minute, in the last week really, have agreed to come to share with us their own ideas and their own um, views and responses to the situation that we now uh, confront. And they come from a number of different disciplinary perspectives. And one of the things we may want to do in our discussion tonight is to think about the way in which disciplinary <coughs> modes of thinking are challenged by the kinds of events that we are now confronted. So this is uh, necessarily a quite broad uh, panel, and the speakers will all have very different ways, I think, of approaching the issues that confront us. I'll introduce them very briefly at the moment, in, in the beginning, and then each will speak for about 10 minutes, and then hopefully we'll open it up to the floor and there'll be time for people to uh, make their own contributions and ask questions. So with us tonight are, um, from my left, Christine Bakker, who's the Senior Lecturer in Politics and International Relations at UCL. Then next to her, Lionel Bailly, who's a psychoanalyst and consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist. Um, next to him, Philippe Marguerre, who's Professor of French and European Politics at UCL. Uh, then next to him is um, Ruth Mandel, Reader in Social Anthropology. Uh, then next to her is Azadine Hadour, who's a senior lecturer in French. And finally, Cécile Laborde, who's Professor of Political Theory. But we're going to be starting at this end of the table, <coughs> and Cécile is going to kick us off. And we will move then from one speaker to the next before we open it up for discussion. So please do um, hold thoughts and uh, questions and problems that you have as they occur so that you'll have an opportunity to raise them later. Cecilia, over to you. Thank you very much, Tamar. Uh, can you hear me at the back? Uh, I want to um, approach the question we were posed with uh, quite a lot of uh, humility, um, partly because I think Emotional responses generally are not uh, the best uh, driver for uh, thoughtful uh, commentary. There's been a flurry of media reactions since the events in <coughs> Paris, and what's been quite striking, I think, is that they tended to only confirm and reinforce the existing views of the, of the speakers. So many of them have not been very illuminating. I'm also quite sceptical that academics can offer more uh, pertinent reactions than other commentators, for two reasons. First, I think because scholarly work, uh, by its very nature, has a different temporality. You know, that's the difference between be being an academic and being a journalist. But also, I think more deeply, because uh, events uh, like, such as these, um, it's not clear to me that in themselves they should uh, challenge uh, the way we think. But obviously, Tamar has just reminded us this will very much depend on, on the discipline, on the kind of thing <coughs> we do in academia. <coughs> Certainly, there's, there's nothing new about extreme uh, violence in general. And there's nothing new about uh, jihadi violence in particular. Uh, of course, the fact that it's closer to home uh, is, more, is more disturbing. But to me, it's not that it doesn't make it clear that uh, it should change how we reflect about politics and ethics. So I'm not sure what I'm going to say is going to be very humiliating. I'm not going to have not heard before. Um, there was an article that I quite liked in the Guardian, I think, a couple of weeks ago by my colleague um, Richard, Richard English. He says there are three bad responses to terrorist attacks. They're very typical responses. They're very common, but they're very bad. One of them is overreaction. The second one is the, um, is the search for an immediate response. And the third one is polarization. Polarization of opinion. It seems to me that the French government has done all of 
free of water things, and therefore has not uh, reacted well. So with this in mind, I just want to make three comments on three themes uh, generally. So I want to comment on empathy and compassion, I want to say something about war, and I want to say something about Islam. So starting with uh, empathy. So there is a huge wave of empathy and compassion from all over the world uh, following the events uh, in Paris. To some, to some extent, the fact that we, residents of London, were uh, affected deeply shouldn't be uh, surprising. <coughs> Many of us might have friends or family uh, who were directly affected. It's also a neighborhood, as, as you, you all know, where people like us live. When I say like us, I mean people who are academics or middle class, professionals, young people, students. Um, you think it's like Camden or Islington in London, right? Um, and the other reason for this wave of empathy was um, that Paris is one of the most visited cities in the world. So many people actually have been to, to Paris or would like to go. So the question then is, it, is it okay to feel more empathy? for um, a victim in Paris than it would be to feel sympathy or empathy for a victim of similar attacks in, in Beirut or, or in Syria or in Tunis or, or in Mali. Uh, do we have a, a problem of moral or double standards, ethically speaking? Yeah. Is the life of a young Parisian more valuable than the life of a young Syrian. So clearly it isn't. So you want to distinguish between two things, so the level of personal ethics and the level of political ethics. I think as personal ethics, I think it's perfectly fine as human to, to have concentric circles of empathy. You don't want to be like a, there's this American philosopher called Peter Singer who thinks that we should have exactly the same amount of empathy and compassion for everyone in the world. But clearly, if we, if we behave like that as individuals, we'd be unable to care for those who we should care for. Right? So I think concentric circles of empathy are, are OK. But if you move to the political level, to the collective level, collective ethics, I think, I think, think things look quite different. And I think when we think politically, we have a responsibility <coughs> to think about the legitimacy of our moral response in a more impartial and in particular in this case, I think there's a special responsibility of the political class and the media, insofar as they're here to represent us. Uh, there's a special responsibility to generalize, to put in perspective, and I think there really was a missed opportunity to show solidarity for victims of terrorism worldwide. Now, of course, if something bad happens to you, whoever you are, it is bad, what's bad about it is that it happens to you. Right? But that's only because you identify with this particular group, not because there's anything objectively special, special about that particular group as such. But I think there was a tendency, and there still is unfortunately, there was a tendency in France to speak as if um, it, this was bad because it happened to the French, not, not from a subjective point of view, which as I said is quite legitimate, but from a more uh, objective point of view. And I think there really was a missed opportunity to Decenter emotion you know, to show that these attacks were special, not because they, because of they threatened a particular, a particularly special way of life, uh, but because it allowed the French and all of us really to to now feel the pain of others too, not simply uh, our own. Clearly, make us feel that we are as likely as as anyone now in this new dispensation in which we live to have to live with the threat of this extreme violence. So what I found very disturbing about this was the way in which the attack was used to shore up very defensive sense of nationalism and defending um, the we in a very def defensive and um, geopolitical fashion. Which takes me to the war theme. So the war in here is, I think, that we, we're just giving the terrorists exactly what they seek. Um, so one of the objectives of, of Daesh is um, to spread terror, that's well known, but to polarize opinion uh, in what they call the soft belly of Europe, or the gray zone of Europe. 
to radicalize Muslims, to set them against the rest of the population, and to undermine democracy and encourage a civil strife. Now, we leave it to others, not to be to my, my colleague Christine Bakker, to perhaps comment on the international dimensions of, of, of the war, to comment on the military initiative and the efficacy of airstrikes, etc. I want to say something about the theme of domestic war, because it's very much the same language that's been used domestically and internationally. So we have quite an extraordinary state of emergency in France, which is a state of exception, you know, Schmittian in that sense. Um, it was originally 12 days, um, it was only used once in 1961, there's a threat of a coup by Algerian uh, generals, uh, rather French generals based in Algeria, um, and uh, it's now been extended to Three months and with the constitutional reform, it can be extended for up to six months. And the sense is that we might live in an in, in, in indeterminate uh, state of emergency. Um, this is problematic. I think the rhetoric of war domestically is very problematic. <coughs> there is no insurrection in France, there is no civil war. There are just groups of very well organized radicals. Uh, and I think the existing legislation on anti-terrorism, police surveillance, uh, should be largely sufficient to deal with the threat as much as it can be dealt with. Um, another very worrying uh, development has been <coughs> the uh, enactment, which is I think imminent, of what I call anti-republican measures, including <coughs> measures that have been uh, mentioned in this country as well, by withdrawing citizenship to uh, terrorists, people uh, accused or at least condemned of terrorist action. And you can see what this is about. Right? I mean, this is not about, it's not a disincentive for terrorists. If you decided to blow yourself up in a metro, you're not going to be deterred by the threat of losing a French passport. But it's, it's, it's a symbolic deterrent, but it's, 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 so it's not a deterrent, it's a symbolic measure, not for the terrorists, but really for the National Front and its supporters, and that's a very dangerous trend. Last point very briefly, because I see I only have one minute and a half left. <laughs> um, so I'll just talk about Islam and terrorism. Um, it's quite striking about this new generation of Islamists, um, and here I drew partly on a very interesting article written by Olivier Roy from the uh, European Institute in France. He wrote a very good article last week in Le Monde where he said, this is not about the radicalization of Islam. This is about the Islamization of ra radicalism. So it's quite a striking new phenomenon here where the young people who were involved in these attacks were not really practicing Muslims. Uh, they don't really care much about religion. They came, they went, it's a straight journey from being a petty criminal, you know, alienated um, a gang in a banlieue, to becoming a jihadi within a few months. Um, and there was a striking image, <coughs> I don't know if you saw it, of the, a woman who was thought to be the one that had blown herself up in that flat a few days after the attacks. In fact, she was, she was still alive, and that, there was a very striking picture of her on the social media where she was basically wearing the... Um, she, she looked like a, like a ghetto kid, and the kind of bodily posture she was adopting was that of a defiant ghetto kid, and she was wearing a niqab. Right? So it's very, very interesting, I think, juxtaposition of different uh, s s symbols, and I think it makes uh, all the other <coughs> point quite uh, nicely. Uh, how much can I take? 30 seconds? Yeah. 35? Thank you. <laughs> I take, take 25. Um, so if, if that's true, I think um, I'm a bit reticent about going into another round of discussion about whether French secularism is to blame or whether it's a solution to this. And to me, these kind of attacks are very similar to the attacks in London in 2005. So, we can compare the two models of integration, if you like, endlessly, you know, and I've written about this, I'm happy to do that. I really don't think it's connected to terrorism. I think we're talking about a different uh, phenomenon uh, here. Um, 
So there's, there's groups are you know, they could be anywhere. They are more isolated. They're very very small groups, and uh, but 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 they're I think interchangeable. They could be Belgian, they could be French, they could be Syrian, they could be uh, Lebanese, etc. And they'd be radicalized more by the social by social media than by any social experience of integration or lack thereof. So I think we're not less safe in France than in Britain or Spain or Belgium, many other places in the world actually, and we are not less safe now than we were a month ago. But the main difference, I think, is that we've allowed the politics of fear and hatred to take over our democracy in the meantime, and I find that quite uh, terrifying. I'm going to pick up on some of the issues that my colleagues have raised, and, um, and we'll see where we go. I'm going to first talk a bit about my personal situation, and then um, pick up some of the, um, the task that we were assigned as panelists to talk about uh, rethinking categories. So um, I happened to be in Paris the weekend of the attacks. The friends I was staying with had tickets to a concert at Bataclan the following Friday night. They were visibly shaken, even stunned, as we saw the news unfold on TV, watching until 3 a.m., seeing the numbers of casualties rising steadily. It was very confusing and upsetting, to say the least. Saturday morning, the following morning, we ventured out to pick up some groceries. It felt forcibly normal. Most shops open, not many, but some customers in the local cafes. People were being instructed to say cl stay close to home. Still, naively, we felt ever so slightly removed in the bourgeois 15th arrondissement, a couple miles away from the attacks a mere 12 hours earlier. However, that evening, eating dinner at home with friends, we experienced a sudden security event 20 meters from our building. The frighteningly full-on anti-terrorist apparatus appeared in full force. The police, amply armed and in riot gear, pouring out of vans, non-stopping, flashing red lights, the SAMU ambulances ready for victims. We had no clue what was happening, and we unsuccessfully tried to learn what was going on, using every electronic device in the house. But this was still a pre-newsworthy incident playing out beneath our windows. Should we keep away from the windows? Should we send someone down to ask questions? But then I started receiving urgent texts from my teenage daughter back in London. Mom, are you okay? I need to know. She had been in touch with a French friend a few blocks from us, and from her teenage instant everything official news bypassing vantage point, she was able to inform us that there was a bomb scare at a local hotel. Probably, uh, sorry. Um, two years ago, I moved back to London after having lived in Paris for several years. As many of you will know, the intimacy of inner Paris is arguably one of its charms and attractions, as is the Parisian habit of inhabiting the city's public spaces, day and night. The often small, cramped flats with miniature kitchens become tolerable when juxtaposed with walks along the Seine and long sidewalk cafe lunches. This intimacy means that Bataclan is well known, and we often <coughs> frequented the popular, trendy cafes and restaurants of the 10th and 11th. Many friends live in this neighborhood. So probably for many of us here, the uh, Paris attacks felt like a wake-up call, how to interpret it. Um, it's unclear. From my own academic, administrative, and personal position, it forced me to confront hard questions. First, as the affiliate tutor in the anthropology department, I'm responsible every year for sending about 40 students abroad. We have two exchange partner institutions in Paris, and several students are currently there. Should I call them home? Should I discourage students from going there next year? But what if they came back to London and moved to the Leytonstone neighborhood? Next, as a parent, this also unnerved me. The weekend following the Paris events, my 17-year-old daughter went to a heavy metal concert in North London, along with 7,000 young people, all packed in, perfectly situated for a stampede. I toyed with the idea of not allowing her to go, and I admit I was very nervous till the moment I picked her up after it ended. I never before had warned her about safety and security at concerts. This time I did, repeatedly. I made sure that she had shoes, uh, shoes appropriate for running that she had a spare phone charger, that she would promise to scope out nearby exits at the concert hall. 
She was insulted and angry that I brought up these issues, accusing me of trying to ruin the excitement of the concert for her. Regarding security, her answer was very straightforward. Mom, no, I'll just hit the ground and pretend I'm dead, just like lots of people did at Bataclan. Today, we're meant to be discussing new categories. So I find this both puzzling and provocative. And as an anthropologist, we study what we call native categories. Today, a glaring question is what to call the people committing the atrocities in Syria. Do we use their own categories, the way anthropologists generally insist on? However, often referred to as the Islamic State, or IS, or ISIL, this term has become a questionable one. There's been discussion in the British government and elsewhere about using the term Daesh, an acronym for a similar meaning to IS, but at the same time, a homonym for another Arabic word, apparently meaning crush, a word aberrant to the people to whom it refers. The BBC has, um, sorry, yeah. The BBC has agreed, after pressure from the British government, to modify the term Islamic State by calling it the so-called Islamic State, thereby denying legitimacy to any claims of statehood, a stance insisted upon by the French in their use of Daesh. Another category, terror, but native to whom? Is living with it the new normal? A great many newspaper inches have been devoted in recent weeks to this discussion. But we might think of Paris as the home of terror. After all, an entire historical period is known as the terror with a capital T. The countless academic books and articles about revolutions all look to the Ur Revolution, the French one, along with its reign of terror. Many subsequent revolutions have been judged by the French meter stick in their stages, results, and anatomies. For Robespierre, terror and virtue were linked. Similarly, Daesh, or IS, or so-called IS, deploys a moralistic, heroic ideology linked to their violent methods. 18th century terror was not the only one visited on France, of course. <coughs> During the Vichy government, the Valdive in Paris was the site of the detention of tens of thousands of Jews who were destined for death in Nazi extermination camps. Maurice Papon, a Vichy official, ordered the deportation of 2,000 Jews in Bordeaux. Nor was that the final terror in Paris. The same Maurice Papon, later as prefect of police appointed by de Gaulle, was responsible for a continuation of terror during the, during the anti-colonial Algerian war. Retaliating for FLN violence, he had his police open fire on a peaceful pro-independence demonstration, and then forced a roundup of some 5,000 Algerians and detained them in a hospital that had been used previously as a detention center. Widespread torture and killing ensued, and an unknown number, possibly in the hundreds, of Algerian, French, and others had their hands bound and were thrown into the Seine to drown. So these past scenes of terror in Paris simply set the historical stage and context for the current state of terror, and are meant to emphasize the pushing to the wings of these past cases. Moreover, most of the terrorists today we see are homegrown, as it's, as it's called. And it's not hard to see how Paris's urban and suburban landscape of segregation has helped foster disenfranchisement among the second and third generation descendants <clears throat> of North African migrants, along with the attendant structural inequality. Another category, insecurity. The discussion today about having to live with discomfort and insecurity in our daily lives, on trains and in theaters, at concerts could be, as some call it, a new first world problem. However, away from Europe, many people, of course, live in fragile states, experience civil wars, military coup, without rule of law. When viewed from a global perspective, over a billion of the world's people live on less than $2 a day. This means that they live in a constant state of insecurity. Apart from no support from the state, lack of access to clean water, health services, and the like, much of the world will never know the kind of stability and security we see as our right and as normal. In other words, what we see as normal and unmarked is rather the global exception. Thus, what is marked now, increasingly, is safety rather than insecurity, our new reality. Other categories, compassion, grief. A colleague at SOAS has written about what he calls narcissistic compassion. Compassion for those like us. The flip side, of course, is lack of compassion for the other, the others. 
Muslims, whose deaths might be fungible statistics as opposed to faces with which we can identify. The day before the Paris attacks, 40 people were killed in Beirut, an event thoroughly eclipsed by the cultural and geographic proximity of Paris. After all, we expect violence in the Middle East. Indeed, we're immune to it, as opposed to when an obscure town in Southern California is hit again, narcissistic compassion. Judith Butler has discussed a similar phenomenon, examining the practices of grief. Perhaps it's useful to consider how the metrics of grievability, how they work, why the concert or cafe in Paris affect us in the collective Western gut in ways that other targets in Beirut or Ankara do not. Finally, to bring the discussion closer to home, over the past 48 hours since the Leytonstone knife attack, the spontaneous response of an onlooker has gone globally viral on Twitter. I'm sure we're all aware of this, and <coughs> excuse my accent, you ain't no Muslim bruv. David Cameron even picked it up in a speech. So in this era of uber instant documentation on social media, is this cause for a discursive shift? Can we look at it as a mass mediated contest or competition for control of the sign? The sign being the contested meanings of Muslim? And I'll end here, because um, I know my time is out. Um, Adam Schatz in a recent article in the London Review of Books wrote that to the effect um, that for many years Beirut was seen and celebrated as the Paris of the Middle East. And he asked the question, is Paris now thought of as the Beirut of Europe? And I will end there. Thank you. I'm also <laughs> engaging the, the question posed to, to, to us all, which is how does extreme violence challenge my category of thinking? <laughs> Well, like my colleague uh, Cécile uh, Laborde, I'm, I'm not sure it, those Paris events challenged my category of thinking as an academic. I don't think so, uh, except for that type of event uh, made me realize that how, you know, the, the sheer complexity, you know, in order really to start making sense of uh, these, uh, these events, you, you need really to refer to a number of uh, disciplinary expertise uh, um, uh, from, you know, across, across the board. For instance, international relation experts, because Daesh is an international organization and that involves, uh, you know, the, the fight against terrorism involves several nations, but also sociologists, questions such as how can youngsters who were born and brought up in France uh, could have committed such horrific actions. Uh, as a political scientist working on France myself, what will be the long-term impact on France of those events? That's a question I will, uh, of course, uh, be reflecting upon uh, now and in the, in the future. But also we need philosophers, uh, lawyers, and also, obviously, specialists in Islamic studies, really, to, to, have, to start having a complete picture of it. That is probably the reason why I uh, refuse to give any interviews on the subject, uh, apart from one uh, piece I wrote about the story or the event, you know, uh, about a week or so ago, uh, President Hollande decided to commemorate, to celebrate, you know, the, uh, to commemorate more than celebrate the, the, these events uh, with, a, with a sort of formal ceremony in uh, the Invalides in Paris. And, uh, on this occasion, it's some, it is something which is pretty un-French, which probably you do much more in the U.S., which is uh, to ask the French population to uh, put a flag uh, by the, the corner of their, of their windows at home, which is not something we, we do in <coughs> France. No one has a French a tricolor flag at home. So that was mildly successful. So I wrote a piece about that, which, which was a, quite a critical one uh, of uh, the action. But apart from that, I didn't. Just probably an act of humility, realizing how, how complex the thing. You know, I've been reading and reading, and there's been so much published, uh, not only in French and English, other languages. And uh, my first request of an interview came exactly 20 minutes after the, uh, well, in fact, the the Bataclan uh, uh, upheaval was still on, and um, I was not even in London. I was in Paris. I was in Rome at a conference, and of course, I politely but firmly declined to. 
to, to give an interview, what could you say uh, about such thing? And uh, this was the job of journalists, and I, you could see the journalists struggling, you know, with the job. And the academics have no, you know, there's no place, no time for an academic assessment. I'd like to make uh, three points about uh, this, uh, the whole topic. First of all, is try to single out a political narrative, the kind of political narrative which has unfolded since the events of the 13th of <coughs> November in France. Yes, as a political scientist, this is where you start from. You know, you, you've got to uh, pinpoint, you know, the the kind of uh, the take, you know, the discourse which is uh, projected. Of course, it all comes from uh, the political power and the highest one in front, which is the presence. And just minutes after, you know, the sort of killings were still on, or at least some terrorists were still at large, and, and Hollande uh, came before the nation. It was a short tele televised um, address, very formal, of course, very somber, and he declared something which was, of course, you know, uh, already uh, sort of the take on the whole event was. Uh, was, was, uh, uh, was, was given a particular uh, direction uh, when he said, well, we're at war. This is war. Which is, of course, a very, uh, very strong uh, expression with, of course, very strong and serious uh, ramifications, implications. Um, one is, of course, you normally, when you're a country such as France, you're at war against another nation of the country. You're not at war against a bunch of terrorists however well equipped and armed they might be, and however successful at you know, gaining territory and terrorizing populations in Syria, Afgan Afghanistan, or, or France, or elsewhere. Uh, so probably, and it has kept since then, this narrative. That, that, that sort of take was criticized, mildly criticized, by some segments of the political class, but not many of them dare to say that. I noted, this is something you said about David Cameron, uh, very lately uh, in, a, in a sort of, a, in a debate in Parliament uh, before the vote on war, on, on, in fact, the sort of uh, deciding on the British uh, strikes uh, uh, in Syria against Daesh, that one shouldn't say Islamic State anymore. But that's pretty new for me, also realizing that there was, it, was a, it was a way to legitimize uh, that organization to, to call it a state. And also, of course, the more contentious association between Islamic Islam and, and state, and by, with this reference to this organization. Um, well, there were essentially two narratives in France, and there are two narratives. One, of course, is the super dominant one. I think you find uh, behind that narrative uh, the president, the government, executive, the main and the main political parties, you know, the Socialist Party, uh, Les Républicains, which is the, conservative, the main conservative party, the extreme right, the FN, uh, which essentially says, well, we're at war, this is a war, we're going to wage war against uh, Daesh. And, of course, to be at war against Daesh is also, I think it has a twofold uh, objective, in my opinion. The first one is to uh, call for a kind of national unity. You know, the president has this sort of, uh, because he's leading as a chief of war uh, uh, the fight against the Daesh, uh, he can expect to uh, gather together around, around himself, to rally around himself, the whole nation, which he did, but I think for about 48 hours. And after that, politics came back and big, you know, with uh, first criticism. But still, that's still pretty much the main, the main narrative. Um, and so, that's what the French call Union Sacre, Sacred Union, where everyone at once, for, uh, once are fighting one single enemy. Um, some people also critics say, well, that's a very convenient way for Hollande, the most unpopular president under the Fifth Republic, to be having this uh, uh, sort of uh, challenge, difficult challenge. I'm sure Hollande didn't uh, certainly would never ask for such kind of challenge, but at least is seen at least, you know, opinion falls immediately showed that from, you know, the, <coughs> sort of the lowest, uh, uh, the low point he was, he started dramatically to rise in the polls. Well, there is a, there's a small fraction of the population, notably in, in sort of partisan politics, you find it essentially the, let's call it the anti-war uh, group in France, 
Never as big as in Britain, surprisingly. France never had. Uh, it was the same in 2003, probably, because in 2003, France didn't join the UK and the US uh, to uh, attack Iraq. But basically, that, uh, the narrative here is also, it's a classic one, I would say, the one of the, the radical left as well, which is basically um, the ultimate responsibility for the rise of Daesh, and of course everyone condemned Daesh, including on the radical left, lies with the Western imperialist powers and their local clients. Notably, they stress that France has been selling arms to Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, you mentioned the Stade de France, well, uh, or, in the, or the main uh, football team in Paris, Paris Saint-Germain, who was really uh, uh, bankrolled by uh, uh, you know, yes. <laughs> Qatar, absolutely, Qatar money. Uh, so, um, lots of contradictions, hypocrisy, and I think they have a point, of course. Uh, so, essentially, it would be wrong to see the, the, con the conflict as a symmetrical one, uh, between two equal evils. In other words, the key to peace that uh, Camp says is to end uh, you know, the French or imperialist presence in the, that region because every time we intervene, we do more wrong than, than good. Um, How much time? One minute. One minute. <coughs> okay, uh, I'm going to be very quick because I have two more points to make. The first one is who are those terrorists? Uh, I think Cécile already uh, made the point. The French Prime Minister Manuel Valls said shortly after the, the, uh, the killings, uh, there are no soci sociological excuses for those atrocities. Excuses, I agree with that, but why should there be any excuses? I think probably, uh, which is, I think is a very unhelpful uh, commentary, uh, but certainly there are, through the uses of sociological tools, ways to try to understand why youngsters who were born and educated in France suddenly turn their guns on innocence. I happen to to know as a colleague and as an acquaintance one of the persons who were killed in the Bataclan and this man was a bright academic who uh, turned out to be in his private life a someone you know fighting for the rights of Palestinians against Israeli occupation so you see the irony of course most people who were killed were of course young people who were uh, open to other cultures people very good people so Understanding why uh, you could you could do that, um, I think a lot of very interesting stuff has been published in in, in French and also in, in English about how that uh, uh, those youngsters uh, have been you know uh, completely disenfranchised in their own country, and uh, it's not again condoning uh, their actions to say that uh, in fact what Daesh seems to offer them is a community. Uh, it empowers them. It gives them a social prestige and recognition that they lacked in France. I think what, uh, another point about those youngsters in religion, it turns out that, the more I read about it, that those people have very slim, scant links or understanding of Islam. It's not religion which drives them. Uh, very, as Edin said it, just uh, weeks and months before joining uh, Daesh, going to Syria and coming back to France and killing innocents, they, they led a life of, you know, uh, normal youngsters, you know, drinking, smoking, and, and worse than that, sometimes in some of them involved in petty criminality. Mm -hmm. So how come can you jump from that situation to, to that? So I think those, those characters are more similar to the kind of a Scarface character, you know, Al Pacino or La Combe Lucien type of character, you know, this militian. Uh, from a Wimar's uh, film, who is empowered, you know, joining the milice uh, under, uh, during the war and terrorizing uh, the population and Jews, notably. So, in fact, all this to simplify and to go to, to finish to, to include that point is that terrorism bears the, the hallmark of failed integration in France. And as Cecile said, Olivier Roy, one of the experts on uh, political Islam in France, uh, said it, you know, we're not here facing the radicalization of Islam, which is often the point made by the media and politicians. It is wrong in the case of the youngsters involved or associated with that, but it is about the Islamization of violence. That's a, that's a very different point. Just in a, 30 seconds to make my fourth and last point, which, which, are, which is about the long-term political effect on France. 
as a political scientist, of course, this is my, my, uh, uh, my arena, so to speak. Um, well, the aftermath of the killings have uh, brought about a number of uh, political decisions, which some will have long-lasting la effect on France, notably the uh, state of emergency. Uh, first uh, 12 days, prolonged by three months, and now the government is already saying that that might go beyond that. Uh, of course, uh, with the revision of the Constitution, you know, the most important uh, legal text in France, you know, to regulate and to put in their provisions about state of emergency, although they are laws and perfectly operational, but we need to put it in there. Uh, which led currently to, for instance, the ban on demonstrations. It is absolutely okay in France to go in public places full of crowded to do your Christmas shopping now. There's no risk, but you can't demonstrate, such as a uh, sort of aborted demonstration a week ago against uh, doing the, um, um, the, the sort of, uh, sorry, the COP21 uh, summit. Yeah, that's right. Leading, of course, to uh, <coughs> Peaceful demonstrators, uh, for the most part, who were uh, with a very heavy-handed reaction from, from the police. And that's really the problem, and Ruth was making a point about that, about how, in a state of emergency, uh, what is, what, in my view, the most worrying aspect is two things. First, the stigmatization of a category of the population, i.e. Muslims, Islamophobia, which is rampant in France, really, is not going to get any better with that. And secondly, um, the extraordinary powers given suddenly to the police. You, know, you don't need a warrant to go any time of the day or night into people uh, breaking in doors, uh, ransacking uh, flats, um, and you know, behaving in a very, very heavy-handed manner. And for most of the time, no, no, no particular uh, outcomes or results. So, last point is about, of course, in relation to what happened yesterday, because all the things are, uh, in a way, connected. I'm not saying that those results of yesterday, as you know, with the uh, sort of ever more, uh, the victory, at least <coughs> the first round of the uh, extreme right, without those killings, the, the extreme right could have won that election yesterday, because I'm not saying there's a correlation between the two, but certainly, it has really uh, certainly helped the extreme right because when you start, you know, uh, setting and launching all those uh, extra uh, ordinary uh, measures, state of emergency, uh, the curtailment of, uh, uh, of civil liberties, um, when uh, you know uh, you have uh, people quite freely can uh, develop a kind of anti-anti-Muslim discourse, as you see now in mainstream media or mainstream political parties. Of course, uh, Hollande uh, did a lot of the things, did implement a lot of the measures the extreme right for decades had only could only dream of. He, he did it, and of course, in the end, no surprise that uh, the main beneficiary of all that was was Le Pen and uh, National uh, and uh, Front, Front National. Uh, to contribute, um, I thought of this complexity of, of the task and, and, and then felt actually quite uh, optimistic and thought, why not? You know, if we don't contribute as academics, who is going to? Because some of these very complex questions need sometimes unusual, different, new ways of thinking of, uh, about the events. And I'm going to focus mostly on something slightly different, which is actually the terrorist, the figure of the person. Because as a psychoanalyst, I work with uh, individuals, with uh, subjects. Uh, and what I found quite interesting is this question uh, of the uh, personality, it's a terrible word, but it, in other words, who does this? Would I do it? I hope not. Would you in this room do it? I hope not also. And at the end there is a moment of choice 
you maybe you have the ideology, you've been disenfranchised, you are very angry, but you have the Kalashnikov and you have somebody in front of you looking at you, a 18-year-old uh, uh, hard rock fan at a concert, do you press the trigger? Or when they are pretending to be dead on the ground, I'm afraid, do you come and shoot them in the head to be sure that they're dead? Which is what happened. And I think there is something quite particular there. Because people say war, but war is usually between soldiers, not just states. But states have armies, <coughs> armies have very clear signs, uniforms and all sorts of things. You declare war, and then there's all sorts of things that happen. This is not war. This is butchery. Uh, and that's slightly different. Now, how can someone become a butcher? That is a question that people have been trying to answer for a very long time, because nothing is new. In the 20th century, probably Daesh or the IS or whatever uh, ideology is not that, in a way, dissimilar to the Khmer Rouge or to the Nazi in some ways. Now, the problem we have is that most of our models don't explain this. And you can perfectly be uh, absolutely certain that you belong to the elected people and you have a special covenant with God that others are, well, not as good as you and being perfectly peaceful. Or even, if you're an ultra-Orthodox Jew in Jerusalem, absolutely opposed to anything to do with politics or the state, or the army. You uh, can be disenfranchised and poor, you're, for example, a boat people from Vietnam or from China, you arrive, you know, who has heard of many, and anyway, from that population <coughs> terrorist, of these incredibly poor, looked up, down, and disenfranchised young people? Nobody. So, our models, unfortunately, don't really explain everything. If you want to look at the behavior and uh, the, the understanding of the person of the terrorist, the one who actually killed or killed himself, killing others. Now, there are some uh, quite interesting uh, academic works on, on, on this, and I think that, to me, one of my uh, leading sort of model has been the uh, Norman Cohen and his study of millenarianism and, the, and the, the personality of the millenarian leader, the person who starts a cult that is going to bring the truth and peace on earth for 1,000 years, 1,000 year Reich, for example. There's been several uh, examples quite recently, unfortunately, of these uh, millenarian leaders. But how could we understand the, um, the, the, the personality or the behaviors of, of, of these people? And I try to list a, f a, few, a few things, a few lines, probably, to research. One, the first one is that probably you need for, to have great content for the law. What is legal or illegal certainly does not matter. So how could it not matter? Well, it does not matter because it does not apply to me. Why does it not apply to me? Because I'm, I'm slightly different. And that's where psychoanalysis brings uh, some interesting models. The, uh, the, the Lacanian trend of psychoanalysis suggests that actually the, the law is something that is actually uh, almost created in the mind of the, of the very young child from the moment that he or she <coughs> managed to uh, move from two to three and, and insert the, uh, the, the wish or... or, or um, intentions of a third party that actually we are all submitted uh, to and who has something that we don't have because if we had it well uh, he would not be the boss and this interesting paternal metaphor in the, in the Lacanian uh, uh, dialect uh, is interesting because what happened is that what is in my uh, theory or in that theory uh, the object of the mother's desire uh, actually has to do uh, with um, our intentions and in life is actually replaced by what Lacan called the name of the father. So in some ways, baby, mommy, daddy, there is something that you have to take into account. You know, it's bedtime, uh, it's parents' time, you know, go to bed because now we're going to have our dinner. What can you do? Well, you say, well, but tomorrow we'll play. Or when I'm grown up, you know, I'll have fun. Now, what happened with the 
millenarian leaders, or the, the, the one who start these cults, and probably after that people are going to follow, is that this name of the father seems to be replaced by the name of the Holy Father. So in other words, there's me, subject, uh, my mother, and actually God, straight, in straight line. So if I'm, in a way, connected that in, in that way, the law, who can make it? God, okay, fine. But who else? Well, me, because I'm, I'm strictly connected. And the others, they're not, they're not, there's no kinship. They're not part of the same tribe. So, well, I decide. So suddenly, legal or illegal, it's my problem, not yours. I decide. The second thing that is also quite, uh, in my view, important is the fact that you have to not recognize the other, uh, the, uh, uh, the alter ego, the, uh, the social member of the same, uh, well, of, of the same tribe, as precisely that. There's me, and there's going to be a, a select few who are part of the same group, but the others are not the same. They are, and then you have that in all um, uh, ideologies of that kind, you're uh, well, uh, subhuman, you're a rat, you're a pig, you're whatever, but you're not part of the same um, tribe, you don't belong in the same group. Therefore, well, I can do whatever I want. You're on the ground. Am I going to feel empathy? Well, do I feel empathy for an ant, for a rat, for a whatever? So I can kill. That's fine. We are not, I'm not murdering you. Because I only murder equals, and you're not. So how does the failure of this constitution happen? That's something also that probably has to do uh, with very early de development in the psyche and probably something to do with the function of the mother in the social field, which is initially, as Juliet Mitchell would say, to stop uh, siblings murdering uh, each other or uh, having incestuous relationships. So something there that fails and, and probably is interesting to, to, to study. And uh, that aspect of uh, the, uh, the function of the mother, I think, is quite crucial because it's um, something that I've been developing in trying to understand how um, the mother is going to be uh, the person who introduce the child in the social field properly. That is, learning to share and learning precisely not to kill or, or, or uh, your siblings or to have sex with them. And something, if now something fails there, and something has also failed in the development of the pattern metaphor, you can see that you have somebody who has uh, its right, well, from God, who does not follow the law and who does not recognize the other as an alter ego, therefore has no empathy or no even, not even a, a, an interest in knowing what you think. So no negotiation, uh, no possibility to, um, to deal within the, the social uh, context. And I think that's um, relatively important to understand because we need we need to uh, understand this, sorry, <laughs> in order to fight it. Because the, the, it's not just for the, the pleasure of having an understanding of a certain structure that may explain that somebody is going to press the trigger, but how could you fight it? How do you, could you spot precisely these, uh, these problems in someone? And how can you, through something that then becomes probably political or sociological, anthropological, fight that aspect of, of the failure in the development. And what I would finish with is to say that in the, in the 60s and 70s, uh, people said that the, the, the personal was political, that was one of the slogans and the, uh, of the time. But I would happily turn it around. It's the political who's personal. Actually, these political actions are completely linked, in my opinion, to the psychological structure of the terrorist. It's not an ideology, it's a quick fix for your narcissism. Mm -hmm.
Um, thank you, everybody. Some incredibly rich and, and informative, as well as provocative uh, contributions here. And I'm aware of some of the tensions, uh, in fact, that have come out. So, um, you know, in this polite framework, it may seem as if everyone's agreeing, but if you listen very carefully, I think there's quite a lot of disagreement actually going on here. We might want to pull out some of those. I mean, you know, does history matter? or are historical explanations a place to go or not? Uh, do we deal with this at the level of the category which is sociologically and anthropologically informed? Or are we thinking about this in, the, in terms of the formation of the subject, as a kind of psychic subject? Uh, and do we need the categories that we would use in individual therapeutic encounters? Or do we need the broader uh, linguistic categories which are around um, you know, thinking in, in, in broad social terms? Um, you know, how important is the law, you know, does explanation involve justification or, uh, you know, what do we do with it? And in fact, listening carefully to all of you, um, I think there's a lot of distinction and difference that's going on here. Um, so we might want to address some of those uh, very tensions and anxieties uh, in the discussion that we can now have. But let me see, um, let me open it up and see how people in the audience responded and um, uh, if there anybody is there anybody who would like to make a comment or a contribution or ask a question um, before we throw it back to the panel. If so you need to talk into the mic. Hi, thank you very much for this point. It's quite interesting contributions. I was just wondering whether any of the people in the panel were uh, familiar with this remark by Joseph Philippe Salazar called Parole Armée, which actually treats uh, specifically on the question of um, the um, ISIS ling uh, use of language and our mm -hmm. counter use of language. And actually, there's been a review in The Guardian two weeks ago on it. It's extremely interesting. And actually, it really, uh, it's one of the few words I find which actually tries to delve even for romantic without sticking to the level of questions of integration, dingo state nationalism, and so on that have been um, mentioned this evening. Let's have a couple of questions and then we'll open it up. Yes, I, I would like to pick up on, on the uh, concept of law. Um, and, and what we see with ISIS is, first of all, I, I fully agree that we have to, to look at the, positive, at the positive narrative which ISIS develops internally. Uh, there was a wonderful contribution about the poetry which ISIS uh, is producing in, in the London Review of Books, which I found extremely relevant for, for our discussion because uh, we have people with Kalashnikovs, but we have also people with pen in ISIS who develop a, a positive narrative of the, of the uh, uh, utopia of, of the community they, they propose, uh, not for Paris and not for London, but for, for the caliphate, and, and we need to understand that, obviously. I would like to come back to the, to the notion of contempt of law. Uh, uh, one, and, and I just want to ask one question, whether the, the contempt of law, which has been practiced by, by the West, uh, and its allies in the Middle East over the past 20 or 30 years has not been a, a, a major factor in, uh, in establishing a narrative which, which allows people to come back to the West uh, with Kalashnikovs. Uh, and and uh, we see an erosion of, of principles of international law, which is very dramatic. Uh, and and uh, I don't think we can, we can think the whole thing through without looking at, at the use of drones uh, or, or the occupation of foreign territory or Saudi Arabia uh, bombing the hell out of uh, Yemen uh, just because it pleases her. Uh, and, and so the contempt of law, I think, is an extremely important category, uh, the most stimulating uh, I heard tonight, uh, uh, which we need to uh, apply in all directions, I would argue. Thank you. Somebody want to take up? We've heard law invoked in a number of different ways. I mean, in terms of the law of the father, obviously, in one sense, but also in civic law and in the kind of legitimation of certain positions in another sense. So it has been one of those categories which has been used in multiple ways from different perspectives tonight. You know. Do you want to take that there? Yes, and just because I, I think it's a, a, a distinction, which is that the um, 
the bombing or Guantanamo Bay or the use of drone is illegal in some way. People complain. They have a framework to complain. So <laughs> they are criminals with regard to a system of law that you can argue against or be protected. <coughs> but in the, uh, the ideology, of certain ideology, that does not exist. <coughs> You're not, you don't function in the same system. It's a system where a written law, a human law, is worth nothing. There's only, you know, the word of God. In, in other words, there is no space for social debate, interpretation. It, it's, uh, it's an, uh, again, it's with this, an extremist uh, ideology. So the difference, and that, that is what, if you look at other uh, millenarian cults, the, the millenarian leader is always somebody who has a lot of money, sometimes in, in the most mundane and funny sort of aspect, he has 10 Rolls Royce, uh, 20 wives, and, and you know, it does not apply. So suddenly it's beyond the law of the land. So in, in, in one case you can be a criminal and be condemned for that, because there is a law and a framework, but in the other, it's not the same. It, it does not exist. Yes, just, just a brief uh, comment on um, the relationship between intelligibility, explanation and justification. So, so of course, it's, I mean, this is a phenomenon that's very hard to, to comprehend. Uh, and there, there have been other events in history, I think, that seem to have been beyond the comprehensible. But to me, it doesn't mean that outside history, in the sense that it doesn't mean that we should stop trying to make sense of them. But trying to explain them, of course, is not the same as justifying them. So I think there's, there's, a, there's a role for social scientists and psychoanalysts and political scientists and international relations theories, etc., to explain how this is possible. But of course, it doesn't mean that to explain is to justify, just as trying to understand what the Holocaust is. You, you can see why I'm going with this. Explanation is just a completely different thing from justification. And I think, as academics, we have a responsibility to try to explain. It's a difficult task. we not all individually well equipped to do it. And I think something like that raises two questions here. So wh why is it that young um, um, French citizens uh, kill their own? And I think there are two levels of, I'm not saying <laughs> this is a simple explanation, it's a complex social phenomenon. It's going to have a complex array of explanations. So that's the nature of, of social reality. So I think there are domestic causes, and of course there are international causes. The domestic causes, I think, have to do with a certain failure of a certain kind of integration, which is not specific to France, but which takes a particular form in France, is, is rooted in uh, social exclusion, a form of um, um, ra racialization of uh, youth of immigrant origin living in the, in the banlieue, and then a kind of reversal of stigma. So, you know, you call me Muslim, I'm going to be one. If you don't like Muslims, I'm going to be one of those radicalized Muslims that I'm going to hate you as much as you as you hate me, and, and this kind of ideology of radical Islamism has become a new ideology of, of heroism and glory for a very small minority of alienated French men and women. But of course then, why is it that this ideology is so powerful? And then we have to look at international causes, and I think they do most of the work in explaining why such an ideology can be so powerful for young European of Muslim origin or honestly, they can be converts, it doesn't matter. Uh, and then the story has to, is going to have to be a very complex one as well, and as, as Christine said. So Daesh is a direct response to the, to the failure of um, solving the civil war in Syria. But of course, it's already next door, as you reminded us, so it's already in Iraq. Daesh in Iraq is a consequence of the uh, failed post-occupation settlement uh, in, in, in Iraq. The American invasion of Iraq comes from 9-11, 9-11 comes from Afghanistan. Afghanistan can be explained, not explained, sorry, but what's happening, what happened in Afghanistan is, a, is the, 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 the rise of this Wahhabi Sunni movement, radicalized in the aftermath as well of the Iranian Revolution. And you can go back all the way to the 19th century where Wahhabi ideology emerged there as a reaction to a colonial uh, takeover of the Muslim world and the incapacity of Muslim societies to deal with this. And one consequence of that is a, is a, is a doctrinal sclerosis of Islam. 
You have to put all of that in the mix. I, think, I don't think you can pick, uh, you know, pick and choose and say nothing to do with religion, nothing to do with culture, nothing to do with France, nothing to do. It has to do with all of these things together. But we need complex thinking. How do you explain uh, the attacks against uh, uh, other uh, Sunni in, in Tunisia or in you know, the world, for example? Uh, how can you explain that? Well, I'm not, not an expert, but I think one, one of the main uh, uh, fractures within uh, the Muslim world in the 1970s was the Iranian uh, revolution. And I think this, this, this rift between the, 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 the Iranian funded Shia movement and uh, the Saudi funded, Qatar funded a, a Sunni movement is, is, is an internal rift within the Muslim world, and that's, that's, part, that's part of the mix. So uh, it's not simply a we the West versus Islam conflict, and I certainly would never put it in that way. I think precisely because it's a, it's a, a, a very complex settlement that it produces this kind of complex phenomenon. In July 2014, the European attitudes towards Daesh ISIS, carried out by ICN and reported by Newsweek, stated that 16% of French citizens have a positive opinion of ISIS. How did the panel would comment on that? 16%? 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. We'd have to see the data, the methodology. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, something out of context like that is not very helpful, but interesting. Uh -huh. and thank you. Uh, just want to comment on something which has been happening in the newspapers a lot recently. So every time they find the identity of a uh, Daesh fighter, say, as an adult, if you put a picture of that person committing atrocities, like Khair al was the latest one. And then you put a picture of him as a child, and then all the newspapers ask, how has that happened? How has this child became, became this kind of figure? And then I thought, well, you did a little thought experiment and replaced the picture of uh, Khair al with any soldier in the British Army, say. And then put a picture of that person as a seven year old and say, how has he become a trained killer? And I think uh, until we can see that there's some similarities going on in these two stories, we, we're sort of externalizing the virus too much and, and not seeing that it's also part of the structures we have in our society, in a way. I don't know if you would like to comment on, on that. Do you want to comment on that? Well, I would say I can. Could I extend that question? Because this is something I've picked up a little bit in, in the newspaper, but just extending that to that particular point is, to what extent do any of you wish to take this down, the question of thinking about this as a crisis of masculinity? I mean, I know we do have the odd woman involved, but there has been some kind of coverage around acts of extreme violence, um, uh, you know, whether they're in the US in terms of the gun, gun kind of violence or the militarization generally of masculinity and the cultures we live in, and how this, these acts are acts of ex, an extreme expression of a certain kind of idealization of masculine subjectivity, which is 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 around within cinema, or whatever. It, it, does anybody want to take that issue up at all or not? It relates a little bit to how the child grows up and becomes this killer. And <coughs> no. Yes. I'm, I'm very happy that the gentleman mentioned this because uh, with a lot of us young uh, people I speak to me and my friends who are French and Lebanese um, who are totally appalled and depressed uh, at the reaction of the French government, of course, um, also of the, the British government. Um, and it does, uh, we don't recognize anything of, of ourselves in this in these reactions because the reactions that are, that are a part of that are, uh, obey categories uh, are in the lines of categories that are from the past. You know, since we're talking about categories today, it's, it's very relevant. And when what we're asking ourselves is what can we do? We're very frustrated because we don't know what we can do to change those categories to make those voices um, that say that. We're, we're killers as well, and 
we, we really don't, we, we, because we're international, we're, uh, we don't have interest to protect because we're students. We, we don't really care about the West being okay. Um, we just, we do have an, a, a universal look at things. And um, I wonder if the panel can tell us what, I mean, uh, of course it's a very good question, but what can we do to change those categories? Um, there's the vote, but the vote, we know that. Uh, we don't, we distrust the vote, not because we have a lack of trust in, in politics, it's because politics show us that they're doing things that don't that represent us. Um, so yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah. Uh, you said something interesting. You said that uh, myself and my friends do we do not uh, we do not understand the decision uh, taken by the government. We do not uh, recognize you know that it's the, the sort of uh, by, by cause of action you know something like, like this. Uh, I think you're not the only one. I'm also struck by the fact that uh, a lot of people, young and less young, in fact, are starting to doubt that uh, you know this prolonged state of emergency is the right thing because. Uh, as I said, civil liberty are really severely restricted, and people really are really starting to feel it now. You know, this is not something theoretical; it's practical. Uh, the violence of the police also. Uh, there's a long tradition in France about that, but still, yeah. it's really getting really very normal, and and, and it's a very threatening police. Uh, the state institution should keep calm, and I think that's not exactly what they're doing. Why are they doing that? Why are they doing the wrong thing, the bombing as well, which all experts, military experts, are, agree that it is, won't sort it. Even sending troops on the ground might not sort it, or it might be uh, a new Iraq. Uh, so why are they doing I think it's because it's, it's, it's the usual thing in politics, the lack of preparation, the lack of thinking. You know, but beforehand, you, know, you need that type of emergency situation and crisis to and then in that case, yes, probably the state of emergency for at least six days, what I would kind of agree with it, because you don't know for the, in the first few hours and days following those attacks, are there still guys at large? Are they going to commit all that? So of course, as a president or prime minister or responsible for the safety of your, of your people, you're doing that. What is, of course, uh, this is a vicious circle is after a while, that once you've set up all those uh, uh, emergency or technical <coughs> laws restricting uh, liberties, uh, well, you're stuck with it. I think in the US it's been very difficult to get out of the Patriot Act. You've mm -hmm. sort of gone a little bit back from, from it, but it's difficult. And I think our fear for France is going to be the same. Also, it creates a climate, climate of fear, which is legitimate. People are very anxious. Um, but I think the you know, good, good government would be to calm down and I think to realize that these were atrocious um, uh, murders, and but they were committed by nine guys only, you know, and we would feel that for the time being, they're probably out there in front of the other people who would uh, think of doing that uh, such, such thing if they can in the future, but at the moment it seems that situation is stabilized, but we are really, France seems to be planning a situation of war, which is really, frankly, over the top. So uh, this is bad government. And, uh, but of course, the whole of the population is going to pay for it, not only simply those who, uh, you know, uh, you could also argue that uh, in terms of, uh, you know, France had voted before that in the, in the previous years a, a series of new laws, you know, about, uh, about spying, about surveillance, uh, which were very, um, which was challenged by, by a number of people in the, from the public, you know, about, you know, curtailing even more, uh, you know, spying on you when you, when you go on the internet, when you when you call someone, um, in, in that you, you know we you know normally we, we the French are very 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 quick to to, to criticize the, the Americans on that you know but we're doing the same exactly so it's all happening now and I feel that the sort of uh, the backlash will, will come soon and it's already started you know and I, I think it's uh, but why is it happening because it's I think it's it's bad government.